we are going to do the God in the fire this morning. Who's excited for this message? I mean, you always think you're in the biggest fire of your life, but I can say right now I'm in the biggest fire that I've ever faced in my life. How many of you are going through fires? You want to know that God is in it. So this is going to be a great message. This is it. This is it. This is what I call the week of baptism. Bree and I were driving up here this morning, and I said, well, you know, I've had a lot going on in my life. There's a lot of ministry I'm always preparing for, and it's been kind of crazy, but today marks the day. It's baptism all out, right? We're so excited. So I'm just going to ask everybody, if you're at all invested in this, to please be praying every single day. And like Henry prayed, pray for traveling mercies for people. We got people coming from Texas, California, Minnesota, Oklahoma, Indiana, they're coming from all over the place. We praise God for that. We thank him that all of you here at Donegal Alliance Church and all of you who give to the ministry are a part of those people. And I want you to know something. It gave me chills when we were worshiping this morning to think about next Sunday, because you're going to have a ton of people here who consider this church their home church. Isn't that incredible? And they can't wait to be here. They don't take it for granted. They are so excited to be here, and I can't wait for them either. So it's going to be an exciting Sunday and a very exciting Saturday. Uh, our baptism service begins at 5 p.m. Make sure that you come out and support this. Listen, Jesus' great commission was go and make disciples of all nations, and you are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're to teach people to obey everything that he commanded. So if we're going to believe that it is obedience to be baptized, then we need to support those who are being baptized. Amen? It's a public confession of faith. So we're very excited about this. Don't forget there's a fellowship time after the service. And if you come to church Sunday morning, we're going to all share a meal together afterwards. Here we go. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read verses 19 to 25. Daniel chapter 3, verses 19 through 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Now because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. What a passage, huh? Packed full of God's truth that he ultimately wants applied to our lives. How many of you know that's the reason you study the Bible? You don't study the Bible for mere theology. When you read the Bible, you're supposed to ask yourself, what does it say? Then you ask, what did it mean for the people at the time they were living? That's always what you do first. Context. What do the words say? What did those words mean to the people in the time that it was written? The last thing that you do is ask yourself, now what are the general principles that I can apply to my life? Amen? That's called context, and that's called applying it to today's world because, you know, people aren't necessarily thrown into industrial-sized furnaces today, but there's all kind of fires that we face that we can apply that to, all right? So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Dear Lord, we come to you because we are a needy people. 
We come to you because we rely upon your mercy, your compassion. We rely upon your presence with us at all times. We are grateful that you are with us at all times. Lord, I'm grateful that your spirit lives in me. The greatest miracle of all. Thank you, Jesus, for providing the way that the Spirit of God might live in us and comfort us and help us in all situations. I pray that your Holy Spirit would go directly to the core of hearts today with this message. Touch us where we need to be touched. We rely upon you your mercy, your goodness coming straight to us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, here we go. So Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face started to change against these young men. And he decided to order the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. So in context, we have to go back and ask ourselves, why did the expression of his face change? Why was he so furious? And since we do Daniel Romans, Daniel Romans, I thought we might bounce back and remember what happened right before this in the three previous verses. So let's go back. Remember that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. How many of you remember that bold statement? Right? These boys were convicted in their hearts. This was what had to happen. And when you are the absolute world ruler and people you formerly really liked and appreciated and who work for you and who have been so loyal to you, when push comes to shove, when they stand up to you and say, we're not doing what you say. You can do whatever you want to us. Our God is greater than you are. That's basically what was happening, right? And his pride was insulted. And his absolute power was, in his eyes, being lessened, right? So he gets mad. He gets furious. He turns into a rage. The Bible says he was filled with fury. Michael Youssef said King Nebuchadnezzar could hardly believe his ears. He was accustomed to being feared as an absolute dictator. People trembled in his presence, knowing he had the power of life and death over everyone in the empire. In all his life, no one had ever spoken to him as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had spoken. Nobody ever did this to him or stood up to him in this way. Jeffrey King brings this important point to light. He lost his temper. Anybody ever lose your temper? (laughs) Listen, when you lose your temper, you're always in a bad way right? The loss of temper is a sign of loss of self-control, which is a biblical quality, by the way, to be in control of the self, not through your power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. We Christians of all people ought to have self-control because we are regulated by the Holy Spirit. So he said he lost his temper. That's always the mark of a little man or a little woman. His furnace was hot, but he himself got hotter. And when a man gets full of fury, he gets full of folly. Never forget that. When you're really, really angry, you do really, really stupid things. Has anybody ever done that? In the heat of the moment, you do stupid things. Never act out of anger. There is no fool on earth like a man who has lost his temper. And Nebuchadnezzar did a stupid thing. He ought to have cooled the furnace seven times less if he had wanted to hurt them. But instead of that, in his fury, he heated it seven times more. Does that make sense? I mean, the hotter it is, right? 
They're, just like the guys who threw them in, they're going to burn immediately. They're going to die quickly. But if he would have cooled the furnace, it would have been a slow burn, and that would have really punished them. So that was even dumb when you think about it. And the expression of his face actually changed. Now, why is that? Well, Albert Barnes says this. We may suppose that up to this point, he had evinced self-control. Possibly, he may have shown something like tenderness or compassion. Remember, he gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a what? A second chance. He did seem to have an affection for them. So the fact that his face changed shows that there was something going on there. He was indisposed to punish them, and he hoped that they would save him from the necessity of it by complying with his commands. Now he saw that all hope of this was in vain, and he gave unrestrained vent to his angry feelings. The situation makes sense when you think about it. Now, the Bible says he ordered this furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Warren Wearsby. The furnace was used. Now, other Bible commentators say it might have been a brick kiln. Warren Wearsby says the furnace was used for smelting ore. We don't know 100%, but it was some type of industrial furnace. It had a large opening at the top through which fuel and vessels full of ore could be placed into the fire. And there was a door at the bottom through which the metal was taken out of. An opening in a wall enabled the smelters to check on the progress of their work, and through holes in the wall, they could use bellows to make the fire blaze even more. This is why we see Nebuchadnezzar being able to look into the furnace after the boys were dropped into it. And he said, heat it seven times more than it's usually heated. I wrote in my notes, in the king's foolish anger, he made the furnace less torturous, in that the men would burn very quickly rather than suffering long. And that is such a strange twist of events there. I wrote this. I remember when I was sitting at my desk, in my office at home, pondering this, and here's what I added to that statement. Could this be a picture of the fact that whatever Satan attempts to do to God's children is a very quick and temporary trial as tempered by the hand of God, whereas the heat of hell is forever. Now think about that. I didn't read that in any commentary. I was sitting there and I was pondering what Nebuchadnezzar did and how his sin caused him to do something that actually worked against what he would have been trying to accomplish. And the thought that I had was, since this fire, we know that this fire the boys were thrown into is representative of every trial a Christian goes through. You all can see that? We can apply that to all the trials and fires of our lives. And since it is representative of that, how interesting that Nebuchadnezzar did this, which would have lessened the time of pain had the boys actually died in the fire. You all agree? And I just thought to myself, I feel like God is trying to say in this, no matter what the devil is going to try to do to us, every trial ultimately comes through the hand of God and is only as long as God allows it to be. Amen? And even so, say we were to suffer our entire life under some circumstance, we just do not regularly ponder the reality that eternity far outweighs that. Amen? Now listen, I've told you this before, and it keeps grinding in my mind. I really do want to work out and write something, a sermon, a paper, a book, about my mathematical studies of infinity, which anybody who studied calculus knows that infinity is absolutely necessary for Integral calculus, integral calculus is absolutely necessary to do basic engineering. 
We can't build anything in this tangible world, including a bridge, without relying on the concept of infinity, which is built into mathematics. And yet so many people want to reject the thought of eternity or an infinite existence. But they shouldn't. Of all people, we as Christians, you know, while I'm watching my mom go through what she goes through, and while we're thinking about the trials that we all go through, we must remember that the Apostle Paul said, there is a glory, amen, a weight, an eternal weight of glory that is so much greater than what we go through in our trials. We have to keep that in our mind because the devil is going to try to make you focus only on the 70, 80, 90, 100 years you have down here. My friends, that is nothing. It is a drop in the bucket. And the devil wants to make you think not much about the life to come. So again, I feel like what God is trying to say here is, Whatever Satan attempts to do to God's children is a very quick and temporary trial as tempered by the hand of God, whereas the heat of hell is forever. How many of you know there's a fire that is forever? And that's the fire of those who do not put their trust in Jesus Christ. Any fire we go through as believers in Jesus Christ is a temporary fire. God has it under control. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. This is what Paul said. And how many of you know Paul didn't have an easy life? Okay? And he was in a dungeon before he died, right? And he, he had went through so many trials. Never was one part of his life easy or painless. Never. And yet he said, our light and momentary troubles. Momentary? Paul, your life was suffering the entire time. Yeah, and he says that is light and momentary compared to the fact that it's achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we as believers need to fix our eyes not on what we can see, but on what we cannot see, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Amen? You've got to start looking past the here and now to what God is accomplishing. Jesus in Matthew 25, 46, said this. These, the unsaved, will go away to what kind of punishment? It's not annihilation at death. You don't cease to exist when you die. Just putting it out there once again. You do not cease to exist when you die. You're not annihilated. Everybody continues on forever after death. Jesus Christ himself said, some will go away to what kind of punishment? Eternal. It doesn't end. It goes on and on. And some will go to eternal life. Do you see that? We have to keep that perspective. It lasts forever. Now, he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Two things to uh, note here is that Nebuchadnezzar asked his mighty men to do this, and he left all their clothes on, which would have been unusual for this situation. John Walvoord, the fact that, I'm going to call him Nebby for short. Everybody okay with that? Nebi, okay? The fact that Nebi ordered them to be tied up by the strongest men in his army also reveals the irrationality of the king's fury, as if these three young men would be able to break their ropes and escape if ordinary soldiers tied them up, right? Doesn't even make any sense. He's going so overboard in his anger. The king did not even want to take the time to have the condemned men stripped of their clothes, which would have been normal in the ancient world, the men's clothing later became a further testimony to God's delivering power. I love it that he left their clothes on, right? How many of you do? Because God is going to teach us something incredible through that. He, he left them to have all their clothing on, and the strongest men bind them up, 
to put them in the fire. Now, because the king's order was urgent and the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, let's just ponder that for a minute because everybody's gathered around to see this. Do you agree there's a crowd here, right? Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to burn these three guys because they won't, and let this be a lesson for all the rest of you, right? Can you imagine this? I just thought that. That's so cool. He's probably like, let this be a lesson for everybody. Look at what I'm going to do to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he has his strongest men bind them, take them up to the top of the furnace. The furnace is so hot at this point that when the men who are going to throw them in get up there, what happens to them? They die. The fire destroys them. And I never thought about that. I wonder what Nebi and all his cohorts are thinking when they watch that happen. Oh, you know, my intent was to teach you all a lesson about what I'm going to do to the people who stand firm to their God instead of me. And instead, they take him up there and who goes down? Nebuchadnezzar's powers that be. Listen to me. This gives me chills. When the devil tries to come after God's children, if God's children stand strong and don't back out of being thrown into the fire that God has ordained, it's the devil's powers that are going to go down. Amen? I feel it in my bones. I mean, I have struggled. I, I was outside, it was two days ago. I went out back in my yard. I was so overwhelmed with my emotions and my grief and my trying to work through so many things. I went out in my backyard and I sat on my porch. I don't know if my neighbors are watching me out the window or not. I have a feeling sometimes since I practice preaching in there and they might hear me yelling sometimes the word of God. When I go out back, I think sometimes they're peeping out their window. But I was out back and I'm like, I need to be outside to do this. And I just started talking to God, moving my mouth, like talking out loud. Not really loud, but I said to God, you have to help me, Lord. I can't, I, I can't sort through my feelings. Has anybody ever had that problem? I, I don't know how to sort out my emotions. Lord, I need to understand how to sort out guilt versus grief versus how to proceed in my life versus how do I go to these places now that I don't have my mom there with me and still move forward? What do you want me to do in the future versus how much you want me to grieve? It, all the... Has anybody ever been somewhere? I just talked real to God. I'm like, you need to help me sort out my emotions. Please, God. And as I said those things, tears just started falling down my face. And I didn't hear any audible voice. I didn't feel any particular scripture come to me. But I just felt the cleansing power of the Lord go through my soul. That's all I felt. I got up from the chair I walked back in the house and I felt like my emotions were regulated regarding my mom. I was able to go have a very tough visit yesterday and I was able to walk out and regulate my emotions. I still don't understand. I don't know what, what God's doing. It doesn't make sense to me. It hurts. But listen, how many of you know that when God allows a trial, if the devil's trying to destroy you through it, his power is the power that's going to get down. Okay? I'm telling you, devil, right now, I'm serving you notice. Shelly Frindle's going to be stronger when this is all said and done. And I'm standing on the word of God when I say that. Because the Nebuchadnezzar's powers are the ones that burned up. The boys didn't. Amen? Listen, here's what I wrote in my notes. When we stand true to Jesus in the worst of trials, even the strongest demons of hell are utterly defeated. The very thing Satan tries to use to destroy us is used by the Lord to weaken the enemy in our lives. Isn't that beautiful? So you stand true. You may be on the edge of the furnace. You may see the flames. You may even, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, begin to feel the fall. How many of you ever felt like you're falling down into the fire, right? They felt that fall. But don't ever turn back. Keep trusting in the Lord. And it's the demons in hell 
that will suffer, not you. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego resisted disobedience to God. They resisted Nebuchadnezzar's ungodly order, and the people who threw them in <laughs> disappeared. You might as well say fled, right? They, they burn up. Albert Barnes, on that verse, he said, and he will flee from you as to that particular assault in which you resist him. In other words, every time. It's not like that's a one-time Bible verse. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you forever. How many of you know he don't do that? <laughs> he keeps coming back. But as to the particular assault in which you resist him, and though he return again and tempt you again, yet you still resisting, he will still be overcome. You are never conquered so long as you do not consent. Amen? All right. Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. When I'm reading the Bible, I, I just pray first, ask the Holy Spirit to show me things, and I kind of try to picture things. I, I remember that this is real history, and I think to myself what it must have been like for them to get to the top of that furnace, and they are now bound, and they fall. Take note of the fact that these men were bound, for this is important to the narrative and the spiritual application we're going to get out of this. They went into the furnace bound with ropes, chains, something, cords. They went into the furnace bound. As far as them falling, I wrote down, this is a free fall if I've ever heard of one, right? You ever hear of a free fall? You're just, you're just dropping. There's nothing there. There's no support around you. There's no parachute here. They're just falling down into this furnace. The other thing that I thought of is more than that, it's a trust fall. Has anybody ever been involved in a trust fall? They do that a lot of times in team building training. They do that at camps for kids. And ironically, I was at a picnic the other day and I saw two young people, two young adults doing a trust fall. And I thought, that's so cool because I just put that in my sermon. But if you don't know a trust fall, let's just practice one right now. Bria, you come on up. You can trust me. <laughs> no, just kidding. No. Well, I, I, I would love to do a trust fall, but don't have any young people who probably be willing to do that right now. But what, what a trust fall is, is one person kind of crosses their arms and stands, and then another person that they trust stands behind them. And the person who just crosses their arm, they just literally allow themselves to fall, go back on their heels and free fall. It is a scary thing. I've done it. It's very scary, but you learn that there is someone there to catch you. But for a, the thing that's scary about it, for a while, it's a free fall until you hit the person's arms. This is a free fall. Amen? You ever been in a free fall with God? He's like, I'm back here. I gotcha. And you're like, but I feel like I'm falling. Anybody? Or is it just me? Okay, you can be in different stages of this. You can be standing upright and see the fire and you know it's about to come. You can be in the beginning of the fall, which is really scary. Then you start to tip faster and then that's where I've been most recently. And then finally, you come to a place where you feel God, God's arms underneath you. Right? Sometimes we have to go into a trust fall. And that's what's happening with these young men. Psalm 118, 13 and 14 I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. Hallelujah. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. That's a good verse to memorize, isn't it? We should all do that this week. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. How about cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved, Psalm 55, 22. Great, great promises of Scripture. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste, and he declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. 
Now, David Jeremiah comments here, although we have no data on how the furnace was constructed, we can safely assume that in addition to being open at the top, it was also open in the front, allowing witnesses to view the executions. We do know that Nebuchadnezzar could see inside the furnace and that what he saw astonished him. The Bible tells us he was so astonished that he quickly got up out of his chair, so to speak. I put down in my notes the astonishment of Christ's own disciples. Think about this. To see the resurrected Jesus is certainly something about which to talk. But can you imagine the astonishment of this pagan king when he saw the pre-incarnate Christ walking around in the blazing furnace with these men of God? You ever think about that? I mean, the disciples walked and talked with Jesus, and they knew him for, you know, 30-some years before he was crucified. And then when he resurrected, they had about 40 days to realize that it was really him. And they connected with that. They finally understood that. And that would have been very astonishing to watch Jesus walk up to you after you'd seen him crucified and put in the tomb. Amen? I mean, that would have been incredible stuff. But I can't, but those were Jesus' disciples and they knew him before he was crucified. Now we got King Nebi, this pagan king who obviously is searching for God in a way he looks into a burning, fiery furnace and sees the second person of the triune God walking around in his furnace. That would have been shocking. You agree? Very shocking. Now, again, when I was in my office studying for this and I came to this question, something hit me that had never hit me before. Okay? Now, Remember, I've always taught you, read the Bible for what it says and for what it doesn't say. Okay, Nebi sees this, and what the Holy Spirit chooses to record of the narrative is that his question was, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? I dropped my pencil as I was working that day, and I thought to myself, now wait a second, wait a second here. If I'm Nebuchadnezzar, and I've known these three young men, and I know that they claim that their God is going to protect them and save them, and I know what, and I've thrown them into a furnace that burned the men that put them into the furnace, right? You with me? And I look into the furnace, I don't care if there's one man, two men, three men, four men, or even ten men, my first comment is going to be, how are they still alive? Right? I mean, think about this. His basic question, you think, would have been, Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo, you're still in there? But that's not what he asks. He says instead, wait a second, didn't we toss three men in there? Now, granted, that's another great question. Who's the fourth guy in the fire? But to me, the greater question would be, how's anybody alive in that flame? Amen? Because we know when he saw them, he saw them fully clothed. He saw them walking around even though they had been bound. And his first question to me should have been, how are those guys not burned? But instead, his question was, wait, why is there a fourth man in there? Which, again, spiritual application that I absolutely love. First of all, the devil can do whatever he wants under the permission of God, but never, no, never is the child of God in the furnace without his Savior in there with him. You all agree? Never, never. The same Lord who is in with us in good times is with us in bad times and is, in fact, with us in all times. Praise God. Hebrews 13, 5. Oh, I keep quoting this one to my mom. Jesus said what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Not in the best of times, not in the worst of times, not in the mediocre moments of life. I will never leave you or forsake you. Isaiah 43, 2. 
which is a scripture that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have had. Isaiah wrote around the hundred years before the book of Daniel took place. So they would have had this scripture. They were probably holding on to this promise. They might have even had that as one of their memory verses in their pocket. Right? They might have grown up in Sunday school and learned Isaiah 43 too because they would have had access to it. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Isn't that a cool thought? As good Jewish young men, they would have known that Bible verse. And if they stood on that Bible verse literally as they were going to be tossed into a furnace, do you think that we can stand upon God's word for the fires that we're going through? Yes, we can and we better. Now, in regard to his question, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. Yep, the devil did what the devil does, but God does infinitely greater, right? You did cast three men into the fire, Nebi. Aren't you big and bad and powerful? God allowed you to cast them into that fire, and you can go ahead and go around as a roaring lion seeking whom you may devour. The devil's always going to do what the devil does until God puts him down, but God always does infinitely greater than the devil does. Hallelujah. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Yeah, Nebi, you're big and bad. You threw them in there, but God put somebody else in the fire with them and they are still alive. I want all of us to hold on to this promise. The devil's going to bring whatever he can bring against the child of God. And I want to go even further and say this. The more on fire and passionate for Jesus you are, the more the devil's going to turn up the heat. Now, I've had so many people who've become associated with Hope and Passion Ministries start taking the Word of God seriously and growing in the Word of God, and then it all <laughs> starts getting crazy. And I say, thank the Lord. Now you're really living for Jesus because you've caught the demons of hell attention. Watch this. Nebi says, one of them looks like a son of the gods. In the King James Version, it says the son of God. In the New King James Version, there's a footnote that says a son of the gods. In the New American Standard Bible, the Christian Standard Bible, the NIV, it says a son of the gods. Now, I've researched this to some degree because I, I, you even have people say, you can never read, never read these versions of the Bible because they don't say it was a son of God in the fire. No, it actually doesn't say it was the son of God in the fire. Now, we know it was the son of God, and if a version takes the liberty to say it was a son of God, okay. But... You have to remember, Nebuchadnezzar didn't know Jesus. He didn't describe this as the Son of God. He described it as a person that looks like a son of the gods. In other words, Nebi saw something he knew was what? Above the natural, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it because he didn't know Jesus yet. We're going to get to that in a second. He said, the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Remember, this was spoken by a pagan king who didn't know Christ, and J. Vernon McGee and other scholars have said this, that should be translated like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar had no knowledge of the living and true God at this time, although Daniel had spoken of him. Having no spiritual perception, Nebuchadnezzar could only testify to his unusual appearance. He looked like one of the sons of the gods. However... I do believe that the fourth man was the son of God, the pre-incarnate Christ. I wholeheartedly agree with him. And I do believe that when the King James uh, translates that, the son of God, that's true. It was the son of God in the fire. Even though Nebuchadnezzar's actual words were, it looks like a son of the gods. Why did he say that? Because he was a pagan. He thought there were many gods. Now, he was soon after this incident going to find out there weren't many gods. There's only one. 
But at this time, that's what he's still believing. Warren Wearsby, the person in the furnace was Jesus Christ in one of his pre-incarnate appearances in the Old Testament. I know this is new to some people. Some people don't understand this. But you need to know a few technical terms when you're reading the Bible. Number one, the word incarnate. Carnate has to do with flesh, flesh and blood. Okay, so when we say Christ incarnate, we mean Christ is in the flesh. Christ came incarnate to earth, in the flesh. There's also the word pre-incarnate, which means before the flesh. Before Jesus Christ came and placed himself in the womb of Mary, he was still Christ. Amen? He was still Christ. And there were times, many times, he showed up in the Old Testament. We call that the pre-incarnate Christ. And it's exciting to read the Old Testament when you see Jesus popping up here and there. How many of you know it's exciting to read as knowing Jesus is the theme of the whole Bible? All of a sudden you're like, oh, that speaks to the blood of Christ. Oh, that sacrifice speaks to what Jesus was going to do. And then sometimes you're like, oh man, that's actually Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. And why shouldn't he? Do people have a problem with this? I ask you a question. Why shouldn't he? When, was Je when did Jesus begin to exist? It's a trick question. <laughs> he never began to exist. He always existed. Why can't he show up in the Old Testament? Because we divided it between the old and the new. He doesn't come until... No, listen. He always existed. He pops up in the Old Testament showing himself. We could give many examples. I'm going to give you a few this morning. So the word theophany, okay, means God appears. Theos, God. God appears. The word Christophany means Christ appears. You remember uh, Moses and the burning bush? What was that? At the very least, it was a theophany, right? God appears sometimes in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and then sometimes Christ appears. Here's three really good examples you can research on your own this week. Look these up. If you study Genesis with us, you already know. This is a beautiful account. Jesus appeared to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, right before Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus shows up. One of my Favorite all-time accounts in the Bible. Jacob wrestling with God. How do you wrestle with God? Because you're wrestling with the pre-incarnate Christ. Jacob wrestled with Jesus, so to speak. And Jesus shows up as the commander of the Lord's army to Joshua. And that's in chapter 5 of the book of Joshua. Read some of those accounts this week and check it out. But... Here we have Jesus as the fourth man in the fire. And he answered and said, but I see four men unbound. Right? So now they're unbound. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lost nothing in that horrible trial except the chains that bound them. Isn't that beautiful? God let them go into the fire. They didn't lose their clothing. They didn't lose their lives. They didn't even lose the hairs on their head. But they did lose something. The ropes. When God allows us to go through a trial, he doesn't intend for us to lose anything except the sin and the fears that bind us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what he intends to happen. And so I put in my notes, what about us? Not only that, but they were walking in the midst of the fire. And this is, I say this all the time, I just want to know at what point, like when they fell into the fire, I guess, I guess Jesus caught them. I mean, I hope they didn't have a hard landing down there. They obviously didn't have too hard of a landing because they're walking around. Nobody's like, you know, it doesn't say they're complaining of a headache or anything, right? They're walking around the fire talking, and I can't wait to get to heaven and ask Jesus, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like, what were the first, what was the first thing that those three young men said when they saw Jesus in there? I mean, when did they first realize we're not burning? 
Can you imagine how exciting that was? Yeah, think about this. This is real history. So they go into the furnace, and at some point they realize we're not burning. And then do they look in the corner and say, hey, who's that over there? You know, or does Jesus catch them? And does he tell them right away, I'm here, I'm with you. You're not going to burn. You know, I don't know what all went on, but I can't wait to find out. Amen? And listen, every trial we go through, we may not know exactly what Jesus is going to say or do as we're falling into it. But how many of you know you can't wait to find out? I want to go backwards to something that I pointed out to you. And I thought I had already adapted the PowerPoint to it, but I didn't. So let's go back. The king's question in verse 24 was, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And if you remember, what I emphasized a few minutes ago was, if that were me, my first question, my first astonishment wouldn't have been that there were four people in there. My first astonishment would have been, how is anybody living in there? Do you kind of agree with me? So I said to God, why? Then why is this what you've emphasized as the question? Why not the other question first? Why didn't Nebuchadnezzar say, how's anybody alive in there? And oh, by the way, there's another man there. Do you want to know why? Because Jesus isn't an oh, by the way. There's another man in the fire. Jesus is the focus. Amen? The fourth man is the thing that astonishes us. Hallelujah. Don't let it ever be said, oh, there's Shelly Prindle. Look, she went through that trial. Look at Shelly Prindle. She made it through that trial. Isn't she wonderful? Nope. If that's ever said about me, push me aside. When we go through a trial, the thing that ought to astonish the world is not us. Not the fact that we're alive, walking around. The thing that ought to astonish people is Jesus Christ in us. Amen? Jesus is not a, oh, by the way, there's a fourth man in the fire. No, the thing that got Nebuchadnezzar, and, and it should have, in his natural mind, what, should have, what he should have said was, how are they alive? But the Holy Spirit laid upon my heart, it's not about those boys. It was about Nebuchadnezzar meeting Jesus. And so in God's providence, that didn't astonish him at all. He wasn't even asking, how are people walking around in there? He said, who's the fourth man? Amen? In every trial we go through, let us act in such a way, speak in such a way, live in such a way that people don't end up looking at us and saying, wow, but they end up looking at our Jesus and saying, look what Jesus has done for so-and-so. Because that's what happened in Nebuchadnezzar. Do you agree? I mean, surely he was shocked by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but what caught his eye was the fourth man in the fire. And I pray today that through every trial we go through, people will catch the fourth man in the fire with us. Hallelujah. Don't be shy. Let him shine. That's what the world needs to see. Father, I thank you so much for your word this morning. I pray in Jesus' name that you take it into the core of who we are. I ask you, Lord, to cause somebody through this message to say, I need the fourth man in the fire. I believe. And listen, my friend, if you need Jesus, you've got to believe who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one who died on the cross to forgive your sin. He is the Son of God who lives today in heaven and gives His Spirit to whoever trusts in Him. And if you want to have Jesus Christ living in your heart, you need to trust what He has done on your behalf as God in the flesh. I pray for all of us believers as we go through trials that every part of this narrative would sink into our soul and that we would honestly walk in that fire with you, Jesus, and let the world see who you are. 
and I thank you in his name. Amen.